Welcome. I am pleased to uh, welcome everyone to today's 11th annual Distinguished Lecture on Regulation, sponsored by the Penn Program on Regulation. I'm Carrie Kalanisi. I'm the director of the Penn Program on Regulation at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. This lecture series is held each year not only to learn more about uh, some of the most pressing issues of regulation, but also to celebrate the achievements of the students at Penn Law who produce the daily publication, The Regulatory Review, which is sponsored by the Penn Program on Regulation. And I serve as the faculty advisor to the review, and I applaud the many efforts of our tremendous students throughout the year to produce a publication that features some of the most important news, analysis, and opinion on all facets of regulation across all substantive uh, policy issues. This annual distinguished lecture has featured both leading scholars and regulatory leaders. Uh, past lecturers have included, for example, uh, the former administrator of the US Environmental Protection Agency, Gina McCarthy, uh, the former uh, Labor Secretary, Eugene Scalia, and uh, the former Administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, Cass Sunstein. Before introducing our lecturer for today, I want to alert members in the audience that we will have a Q&A session following the lecture. You can submit your questions in writing using the Q&A button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will see those questions that are typed in there and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as time allows. Now for our 11th annual Distinguished Lecture in Regulation, I am very pleased and honored to introduce Rohit Chopra, the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or CFPB. Uh, the CFPB is a unit of the Federal Reserve System charged with protecting families and businesses of all kinds from illegal practices by financial institutions and ensuring that markets for consumer financial pr products and services are fair, transparent, and competitive. As director, uh, Chopra is also a member of the board of directors of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Previously, Director Chopra served as a commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission, and during his time at the commission, he worked to strengthen sanctions against repeat offenders and reverse the agency's reliance on no money, no fault settlements in fraud cases. Before his time as FTC commissioner, Director Chopra served an earlier tour at the CFPB from 2010 to 2015, uh, when, among other things, the Secretary of the Treasury designated him as the agency's student loan ombudsman. Prior to his government service, Director Chopra worked at McKinsey and Company, a global management consultancy. He holds his undergraduate degree from Harvard University, and we're very proud that he has an MBA from the Wharton School here at the University of Pennsylvania. Director Chopra is talking today from the CFPB headquarters on the subject, reigning in repeat offenders. Director Chopra. Well, thank you, um, Professor Kalanisi, for really just inviting me to present this year's Distinguished Lecture on Regulation. I'm um, very happy to be back at the University of Pennsylvania, even if just virtually. And I really wanna thank everyone at the Penn Program on Regulation for organizing today's event. Just as an aside, um, not only did I grow up nearby, I was also a fortunate, as the professor said, to attend business school at Penn. Uh, at Wharton, I studied housing finance under Professor Susan Wachter and prudential banking regulation under Prof Professor Richard Herring, both of whom I remember were sounding the alarm bells in the lead up to the financial crisis. And while a student, I also studied at Penn Law too on the side. I learned the Delaware General Corporation Law and the history of corporate law from Professor Michael Wachter. 
Uh, I taught financial accounting and corporate finance as a faculty teaching assistant. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, and you will experience the same today, my classmates, students, and other alumni are now financiers, convicted felons, and everything in between. It was a special place to be to learn about finance and markets. And while I was at Penn, and I was hardly alone on this point, I really viewed financial regulators as clueless and even a little corrupt when it came to the lawyers and economists who were seen as auditioning for a future job in finance to exploit their inside knowledge they got in government that would help dominant financial firms evade accountability for wrongdoing and extract special favors, even when those firms violated the law repeatedly. And that brings me to today's topic, reigning in repeat offenders. As always, my remarks today reflect the views of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and do not necessarily represent the views of any other part of the Federal Reserve System. I want to address a vexing problem facing regulators across sectors of the economy. How do we stop large dominant firms from violating the law over and over again with seeming impunity? Corporate recidivism has become normalized and calculated as the cost of doing business. The result is a rinse-repeat cycle that dilutes legal standards and undermines the promise of the financial sector and the entire market system. Agency and court orders are not suggestions, but many large companies see them as such. While small firms can get hit hard with penalties that threaten their viability and their operators fear imprisonment, many large institutions see the law as mere expenses on their income statements. The special treatment applied to large financial institutions over their smaller counterparts, as well as the too big to fail and too big to jail problems, undermines the public's confidence in the rule of law, a bedrock principle of our society. Honest players and new entrants are disadvantaged, and the whole system becomes corroded. Repeat offenders take many forms. The worst type of repeat offender violates a formal court or agency order. This is especially egregious because they often consented to the terms as part of a settlement. They clearly understand the laws and provisions to adhere to, but fail to comply due to dysfunction or they took a calculated risk. Another type of repeat offender is one that has multiple violations of law across different business lines, but the violations stem from a common cause. For example, I found that violations across business lines often relate to problematic sales practices incentives or a failure to properly integrate IT systems after a large merger. In other words, the company in each individual matter may have dealt with some symptoms, but didn't really address the disease. And we must forcefully address repeat lawbreakers to alter company behavior and ensure companies realize it is cheaper and better for their bottom line to obey the law than to break it. First, I wanna spend some time talking about specific examples of big financial firms that have repeatedly violated the law. And second, I wanna explore a case study of the Federal Trade Commission's handling of Facebook's repeated violations. And finally, I wanna describe some of the steps the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and other regulators can take to halt recidivism and create a system that treats small and big firms equally. There are many examples of large firms that repeatedly break the law, but face few meaningful consequences. And this is, of course, true in the financial sector. For those who do not know, the CFPB was created in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis to focus on protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. Even in our relatively short existence, we have experienced what other enforcement 
agencies have been seeing for decades. Large financial institutions crossing legal fault lines over and over again. Specifically, the agency has taken action against Citigroup five times, JP Morgan Chase four times, Wells Fargo four times, American Express three times, Discover three times, one of which was a repeat violation of a previous 2015 CFPB order. There are many more examples, but you get the point. Repeat offenses, whether it's for the same exact offense or more malfeasance in different business lines, is par for the course for many dominant firms, including big banks, big tech, big pharma, and more. The numbers are also quite large. The CFPB ordered Citibank to pay more than $1 billion in consumer redress over these actions. We've ordered JP Morgan Chase to pay more than $300 million. All told, in the decades since Congress stripped the Federal Reserve Board, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Federal Trade Commission, and other agencies of their authorities and transferred them to the new consumer regulator, the CFPB has already required large corporate recidivists to provide more than $3 billion just in consumer redress. Of course, small players also violate the law. But in my view, and in my experience, when they do, they face punishing sanctions that fundamentally question whether they can remain viable in their current form. Dominant firms, though, seem to know that law enforcement will not have that kind of impact on their viability, which allows them to take bigger risks that come with bigger rewards. After the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and early 1990s, scores of individual bankers were convicted by the Department of Justice. Many were sent to prison, and many of them were operators of small financial institutions. But fast forward to 2008, almost no single senior executive went to jail or was truly held financially accountable, even though the results were catastrophic. And even as Americans paid a serious price when they lost their homes because they were underwater with toxic mortgages. Some would argue that these large financial institutions have just become too big and too big to supervise, and that is part of the problem. Government supervisors can't keep up with the behemoth and convoluted financial products. And government lawyers are never adequately staffed to go up against corporate lawyers trained to spin wheels and run out clocks. Some litigate for years and years with the hope of the regulator giving up or a new, more forgiving group coming in. The smaller companies become the low-hanging fruit with cases that are easier to quantify, qualify, and take to court and win. Whatever the reasons, regulators are too willing to lay the hammer on little guys but settle for press headlines with the big guys. Often our laws provide for immediate disqualifications from certain privileges for companies found to be engaged in wrongdoing. This is particularly true when it comes to violations of criminal statutes. For example, under federal securities law, an issuer cannot enjoy the privileges of being designated as a well-known seasoned issuer if they have committed certain felonies, misdemeanors, or violated various anti-fraud laws. This designation gives, the largest, gives these firms a true competitive advantage over small companies in tapping our capital markets. However, the SEC has routinely waived this disqualification. For example, from 2006 to 2015, the SEC granted 23 such waivers to Citigroup, Barclays, UBS, JP Morgan Chase, and Royal Bank of Scotland alone. Meaningless penalties become a paper tiger when regulators are not willing to enforce them entrenching incentives for large companies to engage in repeated misconduct. Similarly, violating Department of Justice deferred prosecution agreements, which are deals made between DOJ and companies to postpone prosecution on the conditions of better behaviors, have become quite common with corporate defendants. 
For example, J.P. Morgan Chase has a history of multiple overlapping deals with the DOJ. In 2020, DOJ offered J.P. Morgan a deferred prosecution for its eight years of, quote, separate schemes related to trading, despite the fact that, as DOJ acknowledged in the same press release, the company had already pled guilty to, quote, similar misconduct involving manipulative and deceptive trading practices. There has been a lot of noise by government officials that big financial institutions are not too big to jail, but the way government has been treating them suggests otherwise to many. And this simply raises the stakes in what we do as government regulators when wrongdoers are caught. I now want to discuss one of the best examples of failed repeat offender enforcement, the Federal Trade Commission's treatment of one of the largest and well-known corporations in the world, Facebook. Facebook is a clear example of a politically powerful firm that has routinely violated the terms of its government order with no material consequences. I raise Facebook not only because it is such an egregious case, but also because of the potential entry of very large firms entering financial services. It's clear that big tech companies want to get into financial services, as we saw with Facebook's failed attempt to create a new global currency. We've also seen Alibaba, Amazon, Google, and Tencent entering financial services, including with payments, money management, insurance, and lending. Given their size and customer reach, their entry has the potential to transform the industry. How these companies engage in other business practices is how we can expect them to engage in financial services. So it is worth going into some detail about the FTC case against one of the biggest players in this space. Back in 2011, the FTC voted to issue an eight count complaint against Facebook. According to the commission, Facebook, quote, deceived consumers by telling them they could keep their information on Facebook private and then repeatedly allowing it to be shared and made public, end quote. The commission simultaneously settled the matter for no money, but required that Facebook cease its deceptive conduct and implement a program to ensure that privacy promises were kept. The settlement also gave the commission broad access to company documents and personnel to ensure the company would not break the law again. I arrived at the FTC as a commissioner in May of 2018. And at the time, the agency was in deep decay and disarray after years of lax enforcement against large corporate actors spanning multiple administrations. In some of the most widespread recent nationwide crises from the 2008 financial disaster to the opioid epidemic to the student loan and for-profit college scandals, the FTC was essentially missing. And on a bipartisan basis, the commission heavily relied on a no money, no fault settlement strategy where wrongdoers essentially faced no consequences, even in cases of egregious fraud. In the case of Facebook though, the company was already subject to an FTC order and violations of an order were subject to significant consequences under existing law. But for many observers, the FTC simply seemed to be watching from the sidelines as its orders were being openly flouted. A few months prior to my arrival at the commission, it came to light that Facebook allowed Cambridge Analytica, a data analytics firm, to harvest information from more than 50 million individuals and use it for political purposes. This was just one of many controversies where it appeared Facebook broke its promises to employ reasonable safeguards to keep personal information private unless the user gave explicit affirmative consent. And as a matter of credibility for the United States and the US government, I thought it was essential for the FTC to actually enforce its order. For years and years though, I felt commissioners set up our agency staff to fail. Commissioners deployed armies to small scale scams while depriving staff of the needed resources to police Facebook and other big tech firms. It was clear that these firms did not think the FTC was serious at all. 
By the summer of 2019, we prepared a six count, 50 page complaint that detailed a long list of privacy failures, including substantial, substantial violations of Facebook's order. And that was just, that was clearly just scratching the surface of the company's potential problems. But rather than investigating the matter fully or demanding significant changes to Facebook's data harvesting practices, commissioners pursued what many believe to be a publicity stunt. Now, I admit that the negotiated settlement accepted by a majority of the commission made for a great headline, but the fine print in the settlement gave a lot for Facebook to celebrate. Facebook would pay a $5 billion fine, but did not have to make any material changes to its business practices or its data harvesting. Shockingly, Facebook was able to secure a highly unusual immunity clause for its executives, including for Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. Zuckerberg was also able to retain absolute control over the corporation, though the settlement required a so-called independent committee on privacy, whose members would need to be approved by a shareholder vote. And we know Zuckerberg essentially controls a supermajority of voting rights. Three of the commissioners held a press conference, complete with custom-made graphics about the, quote, record-setting nature of the settlement. Again, in fairness, $5 billion does sound significant, but Facebook had become one of the most valuable corporations in the world, approaching a trillion-dollar violation. During the press conference, a senior career official largely admitted that commissioners agreed to forego seeking testimony and documents from Zuckerberg in exchange for a higher fine. It was clear to me that the company paid off the FTC to minimize scrutiny of its top executive's role in any order violations. News of the settlement quickly set off alarm bells among data protection regulators around the world. A global consensus emerged that the settlement was a sham. In my voting statement opposing the settlement, I described how Facebook flagrantly violated the FTC's 2012 order and how the proposed settlement did little to change the business model or practices that led to the recidivism. The settlement imposed no meaningful changes to the company's structure or financial incentives, which led to the violations, nor did it include any restrictions on the company's future mass surveillance or advertising tactics. Instead, the order allowed Facebook to decide for itself how much information it could harvest from users and what it could do with that information as long as it created a paper trail. The proposed settlement let Facebook off the hook for unspecified violations as well. And it gave Facebook a legal shield of unusual breadth deviating from standard FTC practice. Indeed, when the settlement was announced against Facebook, its stock popped. In my view, there were many lessons from the FTC's Facebook saga. For very large firms, seemingly large fines, even ones that are record setting, may appear to be very punitive, but may have little effect. Corporate boards will go to great lengths to shield top executives from scrutiny, even though they are all bound by agency orders. And committees, paperwork, compliance units, and other procedural requirements have much higher monitoring costs than bright line structural remedies that meaningfully change business incentives. We need to learn from these lessons to think about not only how to halt recidivism, but also how to treat small and big forms equally when it comes to enforcement actions. And make no doubt about it, at the FTC, when a small firm got in trouble, they really faced consequences. And it was a two-tier system when it comes to the treatment of big and small firms. Finally, I wanna close with how regulators should be sharpening their focus on repeat offenders and discuss some of the non-monetary structural remedies agencies might seek in order to levy the same kind of deterrence on small and big firms alike. 
Achieving general deterrence is an important goal for the CFPB. We need penalties where the expected financial benefits of an illegal scheme do not outweigh the expected costs. And we need an understanding that agency and court orders are not suggestions. Put plainly, regulators charged with overseeing large institutions have lost credibility when it comes to halting repeat offenders. While headline-driven penalties give the guise of deterrence, they do not work for dominant powerful firms. In the end, we need to look at bright line structural remedies. As any gardener knows, to address a weed, you need to get at the root rather than constantly monitoring what is simply seen on the surface. When the CFPB helped to uncover the fake account scandal at Wells Fargo, it was not necessarily the $100 million fine on the bank that was material. Instead, it was the Federal Reserve Board's decision to impose a growth cap that I think got the institution's attention. And when the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency took a role in vetting appointments of new executive hires, that also got their attention. Rather than relying solely on penalties and procedural paperwork, it is critical that regulators and enforcers shift their mindset in this way when it comes to remedies. At the CFPB, we have plans to establish dedicate, dedicated units in our supervision and enforcement divisions to enhance the detection of repeat offenses and corporate recidivists and to better hold them accountable. This will include closer scrutiny to ensure orders are being followed and closer coordination with partner agencies to ensure that each agency's orders are not treated as suggestions. It is critical that we, regulators, enforcers, and supervisors support each other in effectuating deterrence and compliance with orders. But more importantly, for serial offenders of federal law, the CFPB will be looking at remedies that are more structural in nature with lower enforcement and monitoring costs. Under our authorizing statute, the CFPB may seek, quote, limits on the activities or functions, end quote, of a firm for violations of laws, regulations, and orders. These are reforms that are needed throughout government. Depending on the specific facts, government enforcement agencies have an arsenal of options to truly stop the repeated illegal practices at big firms. Let me run through some of the most important options. And again, while many regulators have sought such limitations on small businesses, they have shown less willingness to do so with larger and more powerful firms, and this needs to change. First, caps on size or growth. When you impose asset or size caps, limitations on transferring or acquiring assets, or other related remedies that impact the entity overall, you are curbing incentives to break the law and boosting incentives for compliance across the board. Second, bans on certain types of business practices. When you put limits on business or product lines, or you close business lines or specific practices, it stops the immediate harm and stops the company from violating the law again in the future. For example, after LendUp violated a 2016 CFPB order to stop misleading customers about the benefits of its loans, we took action. We stopped LendUp from making new loans altogether, collecting on outstanding loans to harmed customers and selling customer information. LendUp, a former darling of venture capital, is now shutting down. Third, divestitures of certain product lines. Sometimes it is not a toxic product, but the business model around that product or the management of that product line, that is the problem, in which case it makes sense to spin it off so it can operate legally under new management. This is especially relevant when order violations stem from a firm's lack of managerial acumen to ensure that all subsidiaries and affiliates are obeying the law. Fourth, limitations on leverage or requirements to raise equity capital. When you put guardrails on how the company is fundamentally funded, it mitigates the chances a company will become over leveraged and engaged in the type of dangerous gambling for resurrection behavior 
that can harm customers and our economy. Putting these limitations on the table also serves as a powerful deterrent, giving financial companies desire to maximize their risky debt funding and short-term return on equity. Fifth, revocation of government-granted privileges. Large firms are often required to meet certain conditions to maintain privileges authorized by the public through administrative agencies. For example, pharmaceutical companies rely on patents and sell products to government payers. Misconduct can lead to losing these benefits. Meat and poultry firms must often register with government authorities and can lose their registration if engaged in certain wrongdoing. For repeat offenders that are insured depository institutions, they can lose access to federal deposit insurance or their ability to continue operating. For example, regulators should assess whether it is appropriate to terminate or limit access to FDIC deposit insurance or to put banks directly into receivership. Congress specified that institutions that are unsafe and unsound may be subject to losing access to FDIC deposit insurance or their ability to stay in business. Repeat offenses, and in particular order violations, may be a sign that an institution's condition or behavior is unsafe and unsound. For licensed non-bank institutions, the CFPB will be deepening its collaboration with state licensing officials so that states can ascertain whether licenses should be suspended or whether corporate assets should be liquidated. If senior management is unable to remedy deep-seated failures, it may be appropriate to liquidate, disband, or otherwise shut down the institution to prevent further harms or legal violations. And in fact, those assets can be transferred to a law-abiding institution or management that is willing to actually follow the law. Indeed, since our nation's founding, regulators in the US have a history of being able to terminate charters and licenses. Today, this should be considered for all institutions when the facts and circumstances warrant it, not just when it happens to a small firm. Finally, the role of individual liability cannot be discounted. When small businesses get in trouble, regulators and enforcers are quick to target the top brass. It is inappropriate and unfair to not have the same approach to big financial institutions when the facts and circumstances of the role of individuals is the same. Agency and court orders bind officers and directors of the corporation, and so do the laws themselves. So there are multiple ways in which individuals can be held accountable. Where individuals play a role in repeat offenses and order violations, it may be appropriate for regulatory agencies and law enforcers to charge these individuals and seek their disqualification. Dismissal of senior management and board directors and occupational bans should also be more frequently deplo deployed in enforcement actions involving large firms, given that it's used with small firms all the time. When it comes to individuals, we also need to pay close attention to executive compensation incentives. Important remedies for restoring law and order may include clawbacks, forfeitures, and other changes to executive comp, including where we tie up compensation for longer periods of time and use that deferred comp as the first pot of money to pay fines. Such actions are more likely to halt recidivism than fines paid from the profits of wrongdoing. In the end, Large dominant firms should be subject to the same consequences of enforcement actions as small firms, given that the laws are the same. We need to end double standard enforcement that exists. We need to move away from just monetary penalties and consider an arsenal of options that really work to stop repeat offenses. More importantly, when the public perceives that powerful actors in the economy and society live by a different set of rules, this deeply undermines the promise of the rule of law and our market system. We can and must change course on this. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Director Chopra, for not only a uh, you know a, a, such a, a attention to an important issue, but doing so in a way that models for our students and for all of us uh, the qualities of good analysis, identifying the problem and understanding its causes, and then seeking to identify solutions to it. So thank you very much. If we were gathered here uh, physically uh, in, with you, uh, I'm sure you would be receiving a rousing uh, round of applause from all of the uh, audience members who are attending. Uh, I want to uh, invite those audience members, if they have questions, to pose them in the uh, Zoom Q&A function, and I'll try to get to as many of them as, as time allows. Uh, I wanna start with uh, one question, uh, Director Chopra, uh, that draws on really, I think the, the CFPB's early reputation as an organization that really has been evidence-based from its earliest days. A lot of attention has gone into understanding behavioral issues uh, at, at the Bureau and in uh, articulating some of its policies to protect consumers. With respect to the issues that you've addressed here in terms of repeat offenders and uh, the uh, reforms that you've identified as possible directions for uh, the Bureau and for other financial regulators in, in the future, do you see a role for research in understanding how well these different strategies work? And does the CFPB have plans to conduct some experiments or other kinds of evaluation research that would assess some of these reforms for reining in uh, repeat offenders? It's a great question. First of all, the answer is absolutely yes. We we definitely need more interdisciplinary research when it comes to corporate misconduct. Um, there's no question that we, I think many people theoretically agree that we need one set of laws and that when markets have a common set of rules, there should not be some players who have to follow them and others who do not. I think the devil is often in the details on a couple of fronts. So. In many cases, I've asked the CFPB staff to determine whether the provisions in initial orders um, that to resolve a law enforcement matter actually work. You know, do they fully address, not no, do they fully redress the harm that occurred, but also do they set into place an architecture that allows the agency to easily observe when the law is being violated again or provisions of the order are being violated. This is a little bit what I meant when I said shifting to bright lines, being able to easily ascertain rather than making lots of judgment calls. You know, vague orders are great for lawyers who wanna charge by the hour they're not so good for making sure that we can clearly see when orders are being violated. I'll also share that we, all, we need to find the common trends about what are some of the causes of um, repeat offenses. For me, I have noticed in my career that there's really two, two fundamental causes. One is that there's some sort of dysfunction in the enterprise. So, and I often find that that is related to systems and information technology. A common situation is you have a large institution that has gone through many acquisitions, but has never really invested in properly integrating the systems, which lead to a lot of errors and, and violations. Another is really more cultural in nature which is, and by the way, in some ways, this is very reasonable. If you assume that there are no consequences or that the likelihood of getting caught is so low, why not do it? And more likely than not, you can harvest the rewards. And if you are caught, you know, it's not really much skin off your back. So I think this kind of um, management culture and incentives as well as um, 
kind of managerial acumen when it comes to systems. Those are two. I'm sure there are more. Um, I think many large firms would say, well, of course, we're going to get in trouble with the law a lot. We have all sorts of businesses. We serve so many people. The challenge with that, again, is that often we find that the violations are really related to one another, that they often stem from a similar similar underlying cause. And I think that's that's really the key and where both enforcers and regulators taking an honest look at their past orders to see if they're easy to follow, easy to enforce, as well as more research on what are sort of the incentive structures in the boardroom that lead to this. Uh, that's great. And, and, and it leads to a follow-on question from one of the members of the faculty at the Wharton School here who asks if the CFPB might have any plans to use risk algorithms to forecast reoffending by particular individuals or in organizations or particular organizations. And I might add to that, uh, the use of these algorithms is the performance tends to be improved with larger amounts of data. Are there plans for data sharing or do they already exist data sharing among different financial regulators uh, that might feed into uh, some of these algorithms that could could forecast either uh, initial offenses or, or reoffending? So it, my sense is that, you know, we know from criminal law that there has been, you know, the Sentencing Commission, there's been other bodies who have have looked at this. I'm not familiar with a consolidated data set, but let me tell you why some of that could be a challenge. I think that oftentimes it's really tempting for agencies and regulators to make it seem like any individual action is solving the problem. And in fact, it is, we don't get the level of transparency often in terms of findings, in terms of um, what is in the order. And as you know, oftentimes the, the, they don't get litigated. So we don't necessarily have um, a full body of facts out in the public as to what happened. But you know, it's, a, it's definitely worthy of future study. I don't necessarily know if an algorithm or formula will do it, but understanding more what are the indicia of again, what are what leads to the violation of an order or what leads to repeat similar offenses? That's something that is important. And we, ha we have to really redouble our efforts across the government on this, because I'll tell you, it's not just an issue when it comes to one sector of the economy. You know, I, I've seen it in, in multiple ways. I'll also just add as a side note on this. One challenge, I think, as a cultural matter among regulators and enforcers is the effect of the so-called revolving door. So, you know, when you have a lot of back and forth, especially lawyers and economists going between agencies and big firms, in some ways that may create the incentives for them to be really tough on small guys, you know, to show that they are tough prosecutors or they are, they are analytically rigorous when it comes to the harm of small firms, but then kind of using a different type of standard for large ones. So at the CFPB, we've actually started to take some actions to root out, you know, revolving door misconduct and think, think more carefully about the effect of that. That's a, that's a great, a, a, a great way of feeding into a couple of questions that, that we have from members of the audience, including our students, about the internal capacity of a financial regulator like the CFPB to, um, to address the repeat offender problem. Now, hearing your lecture, part of the problem with these larger firms is that they have the resources to mount full and uh, full-throated defenses in enforcement actions. And maybe in, in uh, some cases, financial regulators lacking this, the comparable resources or recognizing that they have to 
address a, a much larger set of actors, right? It's just one agency against the whole uh, industry they're monitoring. So uh, what is it that, that financial regulators either generally or CFPB in particular might need by way of, of different financial resources, human capital, uh, management strategies uh, to address uh, the, the, the issues that you've articulated about repeat offenders? Yeah, I, I, I think, look, you're never, you're never going to hear any government official ever say they couldn't do more with more resources, but this is just not reality. We have to always understand that you know, agencies are always going to be tiny compared to the markets that they have to police, and that's okay. I think the bigger problem is when agencies don't have the courage to learn and to understand where certain tactics they may have used in the past just don't work. And it's not necessarily an admission of failure by any individual agency leader or member of any agency staff. It's that markets move, they change, and it's important that people understand that and also evolve with them. In terms of specific areas, you have mentioned human capital, which is so important. Um, I'm really worried that in the financial sector, we're moving to much more um, algorithmic decision making, more opaque, uh, opaque data usages. And I think it's a mistake not to ensure that agencies have the appropriate technical talent. Um, we are at the, at the CFPB um, bringing on, in terms of our supervision and enforcement, those who are technologists. We are doing much more rigorous um, user testing when it comes to UX and UI in terms of how we interact with the public and regulated entities. So I, I, I share with everyone that, you know, the, the legal profession is a, should be a noble profession, but it should not have a monopoly on the interdisciplinary need of how we police markets. We need different types of skills, um, and especially when it comes to technology. At the CFPB, we have people who have worked directly in the industry often, um, who have expertise on market structure, so I do think diversity across the board in terms of human capital is a, is a business necessity now for agencies. Yeah, and, and a related point uh, raised also by one of our students here makes note that when uh, financial regulators assess fines, uh, the money often goes just straight to the US Treasury. Uh, and the student says, and I quote here, this was prominent in Facebook where the whole 5 billion went to the treasury. Uh, repeat offenders often though have many groups of consumers in need of redress, uh, which makes uh, redress more expensive to administer uh, for, for firms uh, and uh, less likely to be part of, 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 a, of an arrangement. So the student asks, how can we maximize redress to consumer victims who are often in serious financial need? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll share with you that I think the way many of us approach it is that the first step is redressing victims for the full range of harm not only their immediate costs, but any incidental costs that are directly related to the violation. There's also the concept of disgorgement or ill-gotten gains. In some cases, the company may have profited more than the actual overcharge or harm to individual consumers, especially in as much that they distorted competition and achieved market share in ways that their law-abiding competitors would have not been able to. Um, and of course, there's penalties, you know, that is supposed to be an amount above and beyond the redress that is given. And then, you know, as I discussed, non-monetary provisions are so critical, but I, I totally am in agreement with the question that, you know, in many cases, we have to be careful when there is unredressed harm, 
you know, there's, but we obviously have to follow the body of case law and jurisprudence around how to calculate and, and approach redress and damages. Um, and we all, many agencies think hard about uh, cost efficient ways to get refunds back to consumers. You know, in as much that people are um, ongoing customers or have an ongoing account that can be made easier. But, you know, when they purchase things in a brick and mortar context, you know, that that becomes more expensive usually. Mm -hmm. And so, sometimes uh, uh, to, to step back now from the actual uh, you know, administration of penalties or redress just to identify uh, non-compliance. Uh, it's a challenge. And a couple of questions are asking about what might be better ways or, or different ways of, 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 of identifying and then responding to non-compliance. One question from a colleague at the Wharton School on the faculty there, uh, who, uh, like me, thanks you very much for being with us, Director Chopra, uh, but points out that the information that can create a lead or form a basis for an enforcement action can come to an, a regulator through many different channels, so whether whistleblowers, market tips, journalists, but also through uh, supervision by uh, government auditors or supervisors uh, or examiners. And, and this questioner wonders, you know, where you see the role of the government examiner or supervisor in identifying uh, non-compliance and repeat non-compliance, and whether there might be any chilling uh, in the exchange of information in supervisory conversations with a more robust uh, enforcement posture, uh, or uh, do you worry more that supervision without enforcement uh, becomes too much of a cozy conversation between uh, financial institutions and uh, government regulators. Yeah, I, I think one of the places that was very clear in the assessments of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, um, we need to make sure that there is robust supervision that is independent, not captured, and appropriate enforcement. To be honest, um, I actually don't worry too much when it comes to this alleged chilling, only because I supervision is the heart of what the CFPB does, really. Um, examination, not through the litigation process. A large number of violations are actually resolved through supervisor, the supervisory process and, and don't, don't lead to a court or agency order. I think the free exchange of information there helps identify problems before they, may, they metastasize. I think that's a healthy process, but in certain situations, um, you know, entities are on notice. Um, they're told that there are issues and they choose not to fix it, or they try to fix it and fail to fix it and it leads to significant harm. So I think supervision and enforcement need to always work closely together. Our supervision is often a pipeline for many of our enforcement actions, and I think that's totally appropriate. I will say this is that for, for, for enforcement agencies that do not have supervisory authority, when they enter an order, they must ensure that that order allows them directly to ascertain compliance not just having you know some paid by the hour lawyer you know send in a quarterly report saying yeah they're following it i mean that doesn't really do anything it often needs metrics sometimes it may need public reporting and i even worry about the adequacy of so-called independent audits unless those independent audits or independent monitors are truly responsible to the agency and not the client who is paying them. I mean, it's a real incentive issue. It may not achieve the appropriate goals. So I think there's lots of ways that we, need, we can ascertain compliance better. It's part of what I referred to earlier that we will be setting up dedicated units to make sure we have clear visibility and that those orders are being um, adhered to. 
And that, that feeds into a, another question in a way that your point about the, the you know, the healthy skepticism about how independent, independent audits are uh, does point out though that there can be some role for private actors, private institutions in monitoring and, and taking uh, actions that could perhaps uh, reduce uh, repeat offenders. Uh, independent auditing and maybe ways of making that more truly independent. I, I don't know if anybody has ever thought about creating uh, some kind of common pooled resource that uh, you know, um, uh, that that firms would would contribute to, and the and the regulator could could then s uh, suggest who the auditor would be. That would be one way of making auditing a little bit more independent. But but this questioner also asks about private rights of action. Uh, citizen suits or citizen enforcement. Is there a role for um, uh, private actors to supplement uh, public enforcement? Yeah, so there are actually some statutes that provide for that. So I have previously argued when I was at the FTC, I argued to Congress that the FTC's orders should actually have, we should think about allowing private enforcement of those orders. And in fact, there is a, there's, a, there's a corollary to this. The, the Packers and Stockyards Act, which governs much of the agricultural sector in terms of unfair pra business practices, um, private parties may go to federal court to seek injunctive relief on violations of USDA orders. So it doesn't allow for penalties, it doesn't allow for other things, but it at least creates um, a way in which someone who's being harmed by it or anyone who sees the problem to be able to go to court and stop it. Um, I think there's something to be learned there, especially, you know, where we, especially in agencies that just don't enforce their orders. Um, that may be a that may be a, a kind of statutory construct that we might think about. It's certainly uh, not unprecedented in other realms of the law or regulation as well. Um, many of the uh, major federal environmental statutes have similar provisions that allow for for private enforcement as well. We are, uh, unfortunately, I guess it's my role as a enforcer of the, of the time clock today. We are unfortunately out of our time today. And I know there were many other questions that came in. I apologize to all of you whose questions we did not get to, but I do wanna thank all of the members of the audience for joining us today. And most especially wanna thank uh, Director Chopra for spending time with us today and for uh, spending time uh, serving the public in your current capacity. We're grateful to you for that service and we're grateful to you for the time you've spent with us today uh, speaking with us at the Penn Program on Regulation. Well, I just want to thank you again, um, Professor Kalanisi and, and others. I hope that all the students who are participating really think about how law can shape markets and how robust law enforcement um, actually can help deliver the benefits of markets um, rather than you know, leading to sometimes a two-tier system. And there's no question to me that we need to make sure that markets function in ways that treat all market participants equally. And I, I, I hope people think about that as they chart their own careers. Well, we thank you for inspiring those students uh, to see what a uh, career dedicated to public service uh, and uh, a career that can uh, span both uh, the private sector and the public sector in leadership positions can mean. Thank you for your time here today. We want to uh, uh, thank the audience members and let you know that if you uh, would like to watch this video again, uh, you can visit our YouTube channel uh, or see other events, uh, visit our website at penreg.org. Uh, thank you again for being here. Have a good rest of the day. Mm -hmm.